Thank you very much for joining us uh, for this evening's session on dismantling leadership, um, a event series that uh, we have started in a collaboration between Leadership Sprouts. So I'm very happy to have Anna and Rolf with us today as um, co-hosts and uh, speaker at the same time. Um, a cooperation between Leadership Sprouts and HHL. Um, we are doing this here as an open session where everybody um, is free to participate um, and also discuss with us. And at the same time, some of the participants today are um, members of a course at HHL where we always discuss what we have seen, um, experienced and exchanged in the week before. Uh, without further ado, um, my name is Stefan Stubner. I am the Dean of HHL. I also uh, chair the Chair of uh, Strategic Management and Digital Entrepreneurship. Um, and I, together with Anna, moderate today's panel. And that said, I hand over to you, Anna. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks for handing over and introducing. Um, hi, I'm Anna. I'm... Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm super happy that I actually can be together on the stage together with uh, Rolf, um, Waldemar and Philip and to have the discussion all around empowerment. Uh, maybe a bit about myself. I'm um, currently doing the crazy experience of founding a company uh, myself. Um, that is at the moment what um, yeah, um, is keeping me busy and also makes me learn a lot. Um, I don't want to talk about too much what I've been uh, doing in the past and but in the future I'm very interested to um, give different approaches and perspectives to leadership and help organizations to maybe build um, better places or become better places and um, and I'm super excited that we are having this um, conversation round with uh, different entrepreneurs who might have their um, different perspectives or same perspectives or same ideas, different approaches. And um, yeah, today we are talking together with um, Philip and Waldemar from Einhorn. Um, but before I give them a lot of space to introduce themselves and Einhorn, uh, maybe Rolf, you, for everyone who is new to this discussion, you can also give a quick introduction to yourself and what do you want to share with the world about you at the moment? Um, yeah, um, I'm Rolf. I'm uh, also, I was studying at HHL uh, way too long time ago, so about uh, 20 years ago. Um, I, um, I'm, um, among other things that I did before, um, I founded Trivago in 2005. Um, Trivago gave me a lot of room to, um, to fuck up a lot, to fail a lot, and to improve hopefully a little bit over time uh, to make things better in the in the later stage and um, and yeah because we had a lot of freedom to try out a lot of things we, we couldn't we could also we also were able to make a lot of uh, experiences around leadership um, and um, after I uh, moved into the board of the company last year uh, you think about okay what do you do with your time uh, and um, Anna and me thought it's worthwhile to take our Trivago experience and, um, and uh, to, to share it and to promote it. Um, and that's what we want to do with Leadership Sprouts. Um, at the end, um, the idea is not to tell people what to do, but rather to give them a room uh, to develop their own, their, their, themselves um, and their organizations. And um, because that's something that we were given uh, and we think that's way, uh, um, missing way too often. So yeah, it's cool to be here um, with all three of you, four of you. Thank you. Um, I feel, Waldemar and Philip, that um, often um, when seeing you on stage, it's always the two of you. I feel like it's a, like it's always comes with the two of you if there is people on stage of you. So maybe you know each other more than maybe you're or maybe you are besties, best friends, I don't know. So maybe your introduction round could be interesting if um, you, Philip, could tell us how would Waldemar introduce you? So what would Waldemar tell people about you um, when introducing you to others? Uh, 
Oh, I wasn't sure if I was meant with yeah. Philip because people always mistake um, us for each other. So no, I thought I'm... Waldemar would start speaking. So normally I think um, if Waldemar would introduce me, I would be introducing myself because um, then that would be kind of our joke um, that I pretend that I'm Waldemar in that I'm Philip. No, I'm Waldemar introducing Philip, but then actually it's me, Philip, um, introducing myself. But then people think it's Waldemar. So <laughs> classic joke, you know? <laughs> 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 okay, then uh, maybe you introduce yourself a bit. Um, I'm Philip, uh, no, Waldemar, um, the co founder of Philip, who likes, um, who's up there um, and likes cookies very much. And um, Philip and I, um, Waldemar and I, um, whatever, um, <laughs> um, built, um, we, we um, met in an um, entrepreneur's organization like eight. Eight years ago, that's where we met uh, Rolf also, when he became our um, shining star of um, leadership um, expertise. And we thought if we want to become anything, then it would be Rolf. Um, and then, um, well, we learned um, about how to um, build a startup and how to grow super fast and make millions and how to hire slow and fire fast. And um, during that uh, time, a lot of uh, terrible things happened in the world. For example, um, the building of um, Rana Plaza collapsed and thousands of people died due to poor working and labor conditions. Um, and Waldemar, I thought, is it really about maximizing profits all the time and um, exploiting uh, value chains? Maybe we should change um, this way of how we see entrepreneurship at the moment. And then um, we started first the Entrepreneur's Pledge, where we um, try to build a network of people who know how to build great businesses, so great entrepreneurs who know how to scale very fast, um, but also um, want to give back money to the value chains. So you have kind of an entrepreneurial motor of how to make the world a better place. And then um, we said, well, now we have to set a good example for that and build a company called Einhorn, um, which makes condoms wrapped in, um, in chips bags. Um, being very successful in condoms can also lead to a lot of product testing. That's why I'm a father of a two and a half year old son um, right now um, and very happily married to its mother. Um, well, Philip, um, do you want to introduce yourself and why you like cookies? Yes, thank you. So if I'm Philip, I'm married to whom now? Because you are also married and actually Waldemar isn't married. Ah, scheiße. Hmm. <laughs> We have to practice Well, nobody that a bit. knows. They don't know. It's, I mean... Oh, yeah. Nobody... We have, like, an open relationship. So, basically, yeah, we share... No, we're not going that direction. Um, yes, Valdemar, um, co-founder. Um, and leadership is all about cookies. And you guys you should really think about that. If you want to become successful entrepreneurs or management consultants, you should, you should really think what that means. And it's not just about any cookies it's special cookies and it's not about the cookies themselves it's also the way you treat cookies well think about that and actually i have no clue why we're here because like i've seen everyone else on this list and i was like okay we're like okay a deliver hero that's so professional really people yeah yes like why so my question is basically why did you invite us <laughs> and, um, what's your expectation and what do you mean with that title i have no clue can you empower too much that's like you would ask the delivery guy, can you scale too much? Can you earn too much money? So like I thought like our title is a bit different from the others. So I would love to know why are we here? <laughs> and uh, why did you pick that title? Very good question and very good discussion round. And it can go to Rolf and me, so, so the both of us. Um, I feel um, that um, with Einhorn, you have created a very special um, organization and a very special um, um, place where a lot of people, they talk about new work and they talk about trends and they, um, when it comes to implementation, they feel shy and anxious about implementing it, um, observing, just observing um, Einhorn from the outside and I've unfortunately never seen it from within. Um, I feel like that you have, um, I will, thank you, um, that you have um, kind of implemented a lot of things very, very bravely. And um, I think there you have a lot of experiences to share. And one thing that I would be super interested in, maybe going right into it, um, 
did you ever have the feeling that you coming with this concept and putting it to the people or implementing it into your organization, you, um, you, you overstretched them, you created maybe sometimes an insecurity that you didn't expect people would react that way? Or was it always that people were like, yay, we get empowered, let's go in that direction. So how, how did you feel about like, now we, ha we have this beautiful place and we can try out everything we want, um, but maybe not everybody wanted to try out as many things as you wanted to try out. Uh, what do the students know about the um, the way we um, we work at Einhorn? Maybe we have to give like a, a one yeah. minute. In yeah, that yeah. would be cool. That would be very yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Waldemar, shall I do that and then um, you add if I forget something? Okay. Um, so we basically um, we started um, the two of us and then um, the company grew a little bit and. Uh, We, um, we started to do like um, half annual retreats where we uh, talk about, uh, where we work on the company all together as a company. So not only Waldemar and I, um, the founders and the owners of the company did that, but also the whole team. And in the first offsite, um, we decided to, um, to, that everybody can uh, make their own salaries. So um, you basically decide what you earn. And we made all the numbers transparent. So everybody knew what was on the account, how much we make, how the turnaround was, how much profits, which we didn't make at that time. Um, and um, that, then we decided there's unlimited holidays because uh, Rolf did that with uh, Trivago and we were super inspired by that. So we always wanted to do this and find out what it does to the company. We decided that if people don't feel like coming to work, they don't have to come anymore because it's fucking terrible working with people who are not motivated to be there um, actually. So we said, if you don't want to come right to the chat, I don't feel like working today. I'm hungover or whatever the reason is, but just like empowering honesty. Um, well, and then after um, time after time, we went further. So The third offsite was in Malaysia, I think, Malaysia. Um, we decided that there's no more leadership, so people don't have to take orders from Balam and me anymore, but everybody can do whatever they want to, um, and that they are basically self-organized. Um, so there was um, unlimited holidays. If you don't feel like coming to work, you don't have to come. No more hierarchies. You can you know, do whatever you want. Nobody can tell you what to do, um, and you can choose your own salaries. Um, the, the difference to the beginning was we were profitable by then um, when, we, when we put down all the leadership. And then uh, last year we took another step. No, that's um, 2000, end of 2019. We uh, donated the company to a foundation. So actually we destroyed the shareholder value of Einhorn. So um, we only have the voting rights now um, and they have to stay within the company. So nobody from outside can decide what's going to happen with Einhorn, but only people within Einhorn can um, change things within Einhorn. So, and the company cannot be sold and we can never take out profits. So that's basically the model. And we do a lot of violent free communication. So we learn how to communicate and to give feedback um, based on real emotions. Um, and oh yeah, we have free therapy, massage. Well, that's kind of a goodie. Um, and um, well, we work with uh, Bettina Rollo, um, uh, who wrote the book with Jana Breidenbach, New Work Needs Inner Work. So she's like a systemic coach to help us find the right um, management structure, if, if that's, or the management culture, better, um, for Einhorn. Mm -hmm. So that's the wrap up. You, you can ask uh, questions in the, in the chat if you want to. So um, the question was, Did we, um, did people get, did yeah. I forget something? Yes, I did a quick survey on Mentimeter. So if you would just like, how many of you guys Nine. actually know Einhorn? So you, you could just click on that link. And if I'm a host, I can also share my screen, but I'm not sure if, uh, if Stefan allows that. You're so, you're so agile, man. That's yeah, crazy. That's, you have no? to be very agile nowadays. It's crazy. The first and question. then you can you can just share the screen with the results or what? And yeah, then we can all see like, the results. Yes, I can share if I'm allowed to. That's crazy. And yeah, now you're a co-host. I saw it. <laughs> yes, really. Well, then I'm um, Th sharing already, my screen. You know, I hope the right one. Yes. And, and why are you bringing up the survey result? Uh, the first question uh, that came is, I mean, uh, 
did that did was it good i mean uh, what were the first reactions on the empowerment strategy uh, did everybody uh, embrace it with open arms or did you, did you encounter some challenges well in the beginning it's always open arms because it sounds like great freedom and then um, when you start uh, the work on the process and you know that it's like a system nobody's ever tried or very very little companies then you see that um, you have to reinvent the way to work together because working in hierarchies is very easy um, you know everybody knows how that works you learn it from 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 the day you walk into a kindergarten you um, basically especially in germany you learn you learn um, living based on hierarchies and then you go to a school and then you go to a higher school and then you go to university and everything is full of hierarchies then you start your job hierarchies everywhere's hierarchies and then you come to einhorn and then there's a well there's no hierarchies you can do whatever you want and then after 25 years of a super hierarchy education um you don't know what to do anymore so this is a this is very tough on people i think how, how did you facilitate it then so that that would be interesting to me so you came with the idea but how did you how how did you facilitate the process that people start engaging with those ideas i think we we're really bad um because we we just thought like you can do everything at once what uh, philip just said so we we read a nice book which is called reinventing organizations and we read about holacracy and we read all this stuff and we we're like yeah let's let's do all of it at once um and uh, yeah there was um, a pure chaos especially like when we when we signed that thing when we, like I, I just wrote an article no i read an article about uh, the zappos uh, founder um, and uh, he said like yeah just sent an email out to everyone and said like from now on we have uh, holacracy and who doesn't want to stay uh, gets like uh, ten thousand dollars or something and we're like yeah we like that idea so let's let's do that so we just signed the document so like nobody needs to listen to anyone anymore um, yeah so it, it led to chaos but i think it still was um, somehow that we shouldn't have we should have done a bit less but I don't think there's another way. It's like raising, it's like in a family, you're not raising your children um, for being always um, addicted to yourself and always dependent on you, but you actually raise your children to be free and to live their own life. And uh, I think what organizations sometimes do is they have people who are in their no regular life are very independent and know how to organize their life or entrepreneurs in, in a very small scale. But then they come to your organization um, and they uh, have to lose all these abilities or think they have to uh, give them up. So I think what we do is very natural. And um, yes, but basically uh, we had to reduce a couple of things and we had to get help. So we're huge fans of, of coaches and um, facilitators and so on. But we had to learn that, that we need to get outside help and you can't do it yourself. Uh, of course, in the beginning, you try to save money and that's why you're doing it always yourself. Um, but um, we, we got more and more people on board and um, tried to fix the mess, which we did because we started everything at once. And that was definitely a mistake. So um, facilitation did not happen. Um, and we thought it would just work because um, we, we were always like um, taking the next, decks, the next steps by thinking what we would like. So we said, we are very empowered. So Waldemar and I can do basically whatever we want as founders of the company. So if everybody's so empowered and has the same mindset um, of being so free to do whatever they want, um, that will empower people to do whatever they want. And then the company will become like a creative flower sprout shooting ideas and building a lot of small einhorns and everybody will go crazy and do great stuff. But um, actually... Um, that was not the case because um, it was crazy overwhelming, I think, to everybody like being like, can I do this now? And um, there's this, um, I would like to buy a new chair. It's 400 euros. Can I do this without asking your permission now? And we were always like, yes, 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 yes. But nobody really, and then some people tried to just do whatever they wanted and some didn't like that. And then um, they, they were fighting each other. And so it was really great chaos. And then we started facilitation. So we got a coach and said, um, what did we do? And she started laughing and said, well, that's very interesting um, way to start it. <laughs> There's also other ways. Let me help you. <laughs> um, um, Wolf, 
you, you, I mean, um, Valdemar said that you were so more or less the role model um, from the steps that Einhorn has taken. What steps do you remember of having done at Tribago yourself? And what were your experiences, for example, with the um, free holiday approach? Yeah, I, you know, I think the free holiday, <clears throat> as, as Philip said, that is a very old thing. Um, so, so um, for, for me, for me, it's always um, um, like when I speak about it, it's, it's like, uh, you know, people love to, to talk about it because like, it's like a very simple concept. But the idea behind it is not that I, it's also very simple, but it's on a very different level because for, 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 for us, it was never about holidays or it was never about time tracking or whatsoever. Um, so we, we, so, so the, when I initially did it, it I thought it just in, very inconsequent to basically not take, uh, so we never track time. And there's probably a lot of startups which don't track time, right? So where they, they don't expect people to be at their desk at a specific time and leave. And actually now through remote office, basically it's implemented everywhere anyway. Right, so so it, it, it's way more easy than people thought. Yeah, so it's 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 there now, and um and so and, and we we of course didn't have that, and then we thought, okay, why why do we do that on one hand, but then we ask people to just take a specific number of holidays. So that was the original idea, but um, but basically, I think what's way more important than that is that we said, okay, time should not be a um like an, an indicator for productivity. And I think that is a major misunderstanding out there everywhere in the world where time and productivity is still, still basically people say it's heavily correlated and that's bullshit. You know, that's total bullshit. That's true just for, you know, it's true for a very old fashioned production industry. So when you, when you, when you, when you stand on a production belt, basically you stand on it for, for, for five hours, um, then it's probably half as productive as if you would stand it for 10 hours. So this is the idea. And then basically people started to do knowledge work and did it started to do creative work. And then we applied the same concept we did for, we did for production. We applied for, for uh, knowledge work and creative work. And that doesn't make any sense because it's just not correlated. If you ask an engineer, like, um, like how, how, how productive an engineer can be, you know, they can be sometimes extremely productive in five minutes and create something enormously uh, valuable. And sometimes they can sit at their place for, for four weeks and they didn't create anything valuable, right? So, so, so we are not in a time anymore where, where you can measure productivity with time. And if you just let go of this thought only, it changes your whole mindset in, in the organization. So, so just this thought, I mean, it's just one, one, one little part of it right but just this thought is already very important to understand that that it's it's today it doesn't make sense to 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 equal time and productivity and when you ex in the moment when you expect people to be at their desk at a specific time and go home at a specific time just the expectation even if it's not outspoken it's already wrong and 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 the cool thing is and that's i think what Waldemar also said the cool thing is in the, in the moment where you take action in that moment you you basically you, you change the way of how people discuss about work because it's not anymore, okay, you know, like how, you know, how, how long have you been at your desk and how, when would you go home? And if you stay a very long, then you're a hard worker, but you start to speak about, okay, what was the output? And that alone is a very interesting discussion, right? So when you start about, okay, what did you create actually? And you don't speak about time anymore. And, and that is also enormously productive even for, 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 for a company. So, so um, I, I think that was also a long process uh, which we went through. I would say, uh, if you would tell me like that everybody in the company, like every single person understand it at the very end, no, probably not. And I was probably not good enough to, to really, really like convince everybody one by one. But, but that was something that we started very early. That was something we started, I don't know, 12 years ago or so. And so, so there, there we are quite on the same side. I, I found it very um, difficult though I started with an organization of 1,500 people to do the same thing that Waldemar and Philip did to basically erase, erase hierarchies, right? And really, um, I, I, we had a pilot project where one team, which had about 450, 500 people, uh, we did basically the same thing. So we told them, okay, from tomorrow on, 
you decide yourself what you want to work on. And I think, to, to be honest, I think there's no alternative. But 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 we were not able to push it to push it through, right? So I mean, uh, it was really but what really happened, hard. Rolf? Because people always ask us that, and they always say, "Well, that works in your little company, but how does it work in a big company? What happened?" I think I think it could have it could have worked, but I think today, if you would let me like go back again, with my confidence today that I have today, looking back, I would probably have pushed through because it needs always people like you guys. We just say, okay, you know what? We think this makes total sense. This is right, you know, and we will we will go this way. And but the problem that that I um, uh, this, um, um, have seen was that it you goes just through a lot, a lot, a lot of um, adaptation, uh, like stress and 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 uncertainty for people and so on. So and and I think I didn't take that honest enough. So I should probably have. I mean, we had, of course, facilitator and change management and so on and so on, but it would maybe have needed even more preparation to go through it. I mean, we did something like this, so, but we didn't do it in the, in the really pure form like you did it. We started like this, yeah, but then we adapted it because we, we, we felt, okay, it was just too much of a, a step for people and we couldn't get the organization behind it. Yeah, um, so we, we took a step back and then we, 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 we tried out another system, but, um, but that, that was also something that we implemented. And I, I, today, I think there is no, especially for, for um, if, you, if you do creative jobs, which I think is anyway 90% of what we do, I think there is no alternative. I, 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 I can't see something else making sense because the, the, the problem is that I always had foreseen was, you know, what, what I had seen is in the moment we, we, we start having a big structure, and you start having team and you start having, having, high, having hierarchies. The, the, the problem is the intrinsic motivation of the individual. That, that's, that, because that's, a, that's, that's the thing that creates productivity. Is there somebody who's really interested in what they do? That is creating enormous productivity. In the moment where, where somebody is just doing what he is set to do, the productivity goes already down, right? So, so even if it's somehow aligned, but if there's a little bit misalignment, Productivity goes down massively, so there is no alternative to intrinsic motivation. There is no alternative to okay, I you know I know what you know like this is really what I want to do, and 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 I thought it's an amazing process because in the moment where people just do what they want to do, in in the as, as long as they are motivated in the right direction, I think that is pre prerequisite, right? So they have to be motivated. And they have to say okay, I want to really like create value here. Right. So as long as this, this is a prerequisite, this is important. Right. So you have to have the people who have this in, in mind. But if they want to do that, then everything else is just I think it's just a, uh, a communication problem. Right. Because 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 if 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 I think A is important and my boss thinks B is important. And we both want to create the most value for the company, then we have to fucking discuss it, you know. We cannot, we cannot just, because what happens right now is if I think A is important, my boss thinks B is important, I will just do B with like a fraction of the motivation. That's the only thing that happens, you know? And, right. and, it's, 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 and, 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 that's, and that's the problem. So, 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 so in the moment where I, mean, where I can do what I want, I communicate that and then my boss has a problem. He cannot, he cannot tell me what to do anymore. He can only inspire me. He can only make the, the value that is created transparent, right? And, and what are the circumstances, I think, is so important uh, to that. Like, uh, picking up what you just said, like, if we go to empowerment and talking about intrinsic motivation, I, my hypothesis is that it's almost impossible because the circumstances are not given for intrinsic motivation. We see all the statistics out there. 69% of the Germans, there's a yearly Gallup uh, study where they ask employees in Germany how many of them actually do what is said, and 69%, 16% have just quit already. So it's 85% of the workforce of employees in Germany. And this is the same statistics over and over every year. Um, either quit or do whatever is told them to do. And I think the circumstances for intrinsic motivation are very important. And I think if there is A and B and there's a boss and there's no boss, <laughs> it's pretty clear um, that this is not, uh, not working. I know we're very tough on that, but we thought actually 
we, Philip and I were very intrinsically motivated. Like most entrepreneurs and founders are very much motivated. Otherwise you wouldn't do that shit. So you're very much motivated. And we always asked ourselves or so in prior startups, why, do, why are we the only one motivated? Why are they the <laughs> only one to, uh, responsible for everything? Why are we the only one working after 8 p.m.? Why, 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 why? But then, I know the answer. <laughs> you know the answer? It's because of the cookies, you know? We get all the cookies because we own the shares of the cookie monster. You go very far, my dear. I wouldn't. Uh, I, w I wasn't ready talking about cookies yet. Uh, I'd like uh, maybe we we, uh, we we talk about other stuff yet uh, before we come to cookies because I know cookies. Is okay, okay. Hard. I didn't want. I didn't want to open the cookie discussion yet. I'm sorry. You can talk about the cookies uh, a bit I, later. I may jump in um, um, uh, because it has something to do. Who is that? I can't see you. This is Stefan. This is, this is the dean of the university. Coming from. You need to Hello? be more respectful. Yes, unfortunately, I cannot put myself uh, and make my picture bigger. So I hope we'll, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you recognize my voice. Um, I just wanted to bring Stefan, in. Stefan, is this you? <laughs> yes, this is the Dean, Philip. Yes, Maldemar, it's me. No, that's Philip now. No, now it's Maldemar, it says in the screen. Thanks, Philip. No, anyway, um, three questions that I wanted to uh, bring in from the audience in the chat and um, which have something to do with the uh, imminent discussion that we are having. The first one is empowerment. Um, Rolf, you mentioned that, uh, well, then you need to discuss a question that is coming is, um, how do you actually manage the organization, uh, Philip and Waldemar, um, how do you make sure that people do stuff, because if everybody's empowered, everybody could do what she or he thinks is right, even if everybody else says, no, don't do that. Yeah, but I do it. Okay. I'm empowered. First part. Second part. If you need to discuss what do you do with urgent tasks, how do you make sure that if something really, really important needs to be done, that it's done and you don't uh, over discuss it. And the third part, uh, salary, the, the, the biggest secret in, uh, German co in corporate Germany, nobody talks about their salaries. That is a, that, that I would be so curious um, and other people in the audience as well. How did your organization take that? I mean, did everybody have the same salary before? So it was okay to share it? Or, or what happened when people saw what they earned compared to others? Stefan, can you repeat the first question? Because you asked now five and uh, already forgot the first one, which I thought Sorry. was the most interesting. How do you manage that kind of hi hierarchy, I think? Uh, yeah, no, empowerment. If you empower everybody, how do you get things done? Uh, make make sure that get things get done right so so first of all that people first of all the question was that people do things so for, so so i think it's a big misunderstanding that uh, we think that we have to make people do things so th so you have a lot of students here a lot of people there i think they all want to do stuff so when 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 i was when when you are were a little little stefan and you were like 3 years old and your 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 parents gave you like a big bucket of legos you were not asking them, okay, and, and now, right? I, I think it's doing things like creating stuff is that something that is fulfilling for us and that we always want to do. So, so just having this idea that we, we have to make people work or do things is already weird. So, so no, we don't have to make people, we have, so, so I think the only thing that we have to do, we have to make sure that they are not like, stuck in something, right? That they, that, 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 that we make, they have to make their way free to work because people want that. And, the, the re, and, we, and if they don't work, we have to ask ourselves why they don't work. Maybe it's their motivation or they don't have a participation in the company, I don't know, but, but maybe it's because they don't create stuff, maybe because they don't see like that, the, that what they create makes sense, right? There's a lot of reasons, you know, why people get stuck, but then we should ask ourselves, you know, why they don't do that because it's not natural. It's not natural that they don't want to do things. And then the question was, okay, how do you make sure that they all walk in one direction, right? So, so first, so I think that's the job of a leader. So the job of the leader is to inspire and to, to, go, to, to let people go into one direction. That's a job. And if they don't do that, then the leader should ask himself, herself, if she did a good job or why it's the case that people don't follow her. This is just an information problem because people would not follow her anyway. Because in another case, I'm as a leader, I'm just telling what to do and people follow, follow me because they have to, but not because they think it's right. So the problem is the same. 
if you do have a hierarchy or no hierarchy, the good thing is with no hierarchy, you have a way better information structure because you realize that people don't want to follow you. Right. Because so they have I, the I, choice, right? They can because um, they have the because they have yeah. the choice. They have a real you choice. They can, the, yeah. yeah. It, and if, if it's honest, then it, it also works yeah. because that, I mean, get, at Einhorn, yeah. we call this a pull instead of push where you, um, where people create things that really pull your attention, like the box of Lego. And then everybody wants to go there because there's like a drag coming there. That's like this great idea coming. And then everybody's like, I want to work on that project because that sounds super interesting. And the push thing is you need leaders and hierarchies to push people in the right direction which always takes a lot of energy because pushing people to things that they don't really intrinsically want to do, like, uh, like Rolf said, because it doesn't make sense to them or they feel that it doesn't make any sense, um, is of course, it's hard work to convince them otherwise. And that is super interesting just to, to go into that is because it's two approaches. It's, it was not the case, like with everything that you just said, Rolf, that we had no leaders within uh, Trivago and we actually had several hierarchies also within leadership um, um, and our leadership idea. So it, it's not as like, let's, let's, let's call it radical. Maybe it's also not at all radical and super logical to say, okay, let's have no hierarchies at all. Um, because then, then you have a completely different discussion about following somebody or not following somebody. You know what I mean? Um, so I think still, like you're saying the same or a lot of same things, still you did different things within your organization. And maybe Rolf, you can share also why we, why we did not even go harder against no hierarchies or um, what was the pain there? Yeah, because I, because I failed. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, really, I mean, I, I did it with Hotel Search, so I did it with one team. And we really, we really did exactly this. So we, we said from what we, one day to another, we said, okay, you guys are now free to work on whatever project you want to work on, right? And, um, and, and, and it was self-organized. So people really self-organized, people were proposing things and then other people were following and there was, and, and people could basically move from project to project. And, uh, and I think it makes, all, it, 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 it's also, it also worked because projects that were not running well, that were not well executed, where there was not a good leader, they would they get less people. Other projects which were well executed, they get more people. Uh, projects where people thought, oh, this is not a good purpose, they got less people. Projects, uh, other, um, other projects got more people. So it, it, it worked. But the problem was that, I, that I, fa I faced there was that people were really under a huge stress. So because they were not used to this way of working. So they, they were really like, they, they couldn't live with this idea of not having a team for a while, right? And not being in a context, in a social context, not being a social being and being kind of taken care of. And that is of course a little bit the difference of uh, what, what Waldemar and Philip have because everybody in Einhorn is a small organization. People still probably feel taken care of. If you're doing this in a super large organization, I think that's a problem. So, so people were feeling this instability. And at the end, that was also causing them harm, you know, and, 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 and I had not the guts basically to, to really go through that process with them. You know, maybe today I would, I would see that differently. But, um, but, but I, I, in that time, I didn't do it. I think what we then did with Trivago was on a different level. So we tried to basically, um, what we, what we tried on a company level was that we tried to get rid of hierarchies in, 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 in the way that we had kind of different structures at the same time, which were providing some kind of stability. So what we had, for example, we, we had a kind of a mentor system. So where basically um, the, the, what you would call personal verantwortung in German. So like the, 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 how do you say, reporting line uh, was basically or the person who was responsible for uh, promotion and so on was not the person who was leading me on a day-to-day -day level. So, so we basically split up these hierarchies so that we had a, a, a stable kind of a stable kind of environment so that somebody would always work with one person who was at the end basically my mentor, the person who was responsible for developing me within the company. 
So that was always a stable, basically a stable link that we provided. Um, while we tried to keep basically the, still the system in which people worked and the responsibilities of people kept them as fluent as possible. Not as fluent as you guys did that, but we tried to keep them as fluent as possible. So people could, were still able to move from HR to engineering and from engineering to marketing and so on and move around. And they could still still have a, had a lot of impact on like deciding where they want to work. Um, so they, they were still able to doing that but not on a project level or so. And, 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 um, and, and the way basically how, when we, we did strategy was that we not, never gave people a strategy. So we never said, okay, these are our goals. And then basically we're kind of pushing them downward. So, but basically the way how we did it was we're always inspiration. So we basically said, okay, this is what the leadership team thinks, how the reality looks like. This is what, how we think that, that where the company should go. Now the teams do their thing. Right. And then they started to prepare their own strategy and they, but they were not basically bound to, to take specific things over, but they were just, they were just asked to, okay, listen to what we say and how we look at the world and now do your thing. Right. So we, we, we implemented it in a more, at the end, in a more uh, digestible way, but it was still extremely, extremely challenging. So I think, I think what we, what we should be aware is that the leadership style that you guys do or the leadership style we, that we do, that, that uh, we did, um, it's uh, based a lot on empowerment. I think this leadership style needs, um, is extremely challenging for leaders, extremely challenging. So, 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 so for the people then who have to inspire, to have to get people around them, for them, it's way, way harder. For them, it's way, way harder. And that's also why, why there's so many organizations who don't want to try it because for the leader, it's harder. For you guys, it's super hard, right? Because you have to get people around you. You have to still, you will still want to give them kind of an idea like what you do and so on, what's important and, and you still want to share your perspective. So it's really, 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 really um, very, very, very um, um, challenging. And, and that's why everybody is like, the leaders usually in an organization don't want to do it. Because yeah. it's, it's, it's way easier to, to lead hierarchically, get everybody, every day you get said, oh, you're amazing. You're such an amazing boss. You know, you're so <laughs> good, right? And, and uh, people are doing what you think they should do. Uh, you measure people by your own standards and nobody else's standards. You, 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 you measure them by your KPIs and nobody else's KPIs. And, 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 and you have a, have a quick idea of who is a good performer and who's a bad performer because the good performers are those who are, those who are like you and the bad performers are, are performing on a different level, right? Welcome that's to so patriarchy. That's how this works. That's, that's so much easier, right? That's so much easier and it's so much relaxing. You know, that's so much more peace of mind from, the, from a leader perspective. And that's why, that's why the organizations are not doing it, not because it's less productive. They don't do it because, because it's, it's so challenging for, for people who, who are in responsibility, I think. It's also a factor for shareholder value because if people do what they really want to do, they will not follow up with projects that um, just maximize the, um, the value chain. It doesn't make any sense to most people because they don't benefit from it because other people benefit from it, I think. So if you make it, if you make it really transparent, um, <laughs> It, uh, it really I, changes. I, I think it's a better way. I think what you do is a better way. I, I totally agree to that. It's, it's, I, I, I still think that this is not the only motivation for people. So we, we also try to really like, uh, we, we, we didn't go so far. We, we, we try to do a lot of stock participation. I think there were a lot of people really participating a lot from Trivago. We, we didn't get, go the, the way that you went also because we couldn't anymore, right? At the specific point in time when we came to the realization. And, um, but, um, but I think it's also uh, still, even for, for companies which are already on the stock market or whatever, I think they cannot relax and say, okay, we don't, we can't do it anyway, because, uh, because the only way to do it is to create a purpose uh, uh, um, company. I think they can do a lot, you know, I think they can still do a lot to, and, and do a lot to make people more happy and to be a more productive company, you know? Well, but then it's not the whole nine yards, right? That's true, but it, I mean, that, that's probably where we did. Well, I mean, I mean, if you talk about, um, because I thought immediately thought like the, the, the title of the whole discussion is, can you empower uh, too much, right? 
And if you are really honest, you can't. So if it's about like creating the best environment and the, the best soil for people, what you just described, then you can't. For a shareholder value company, you can, because it will fuck up your shareholder value. If I'm you do sure. if you do too much, I think because uh, people what, will what question what they really do and why they do it. And if if you if you really look for the purpose and then the purpose is um, make money with tooth toothpaste, then that's really boring. And I th this question is also in the uh, in the chat. Like, how do you get people to do um, unwanted chores, like things nobody wants to do? Um, and I think if it's about something bigger, something something great, and you are part of that then um, people will do all the chores needed and that's fine. And everybody likes to do some things. Um, and then you can be passionate about everything. But if it's just to make, um, because you have to, then that's, a, that's another level, I think. And, but that's a level you <clears throat> also have to learn because it's um, learning that this is all real and making it transparent and communicating about it and really getting people to feel this, uh, that it's, that it's true that it's not well you can do whatever you want except but it's really like that then um quick, quick that's where you have to go i think quick uh, question from the dean uh, again can... Hello, the voice from the off um <laughs> spooky isn't it um but how did you deal in your organizations with people that don't share your purpose because i would assume if you're going back to economic theory, there might always be people who try to defect, who say, well, great, we're empowered. There's so many people in that organization that, that share the same purpose, the same objective. They will do the unwanted course. And I just sit there in my, on my little desk in my 400 euro uh, chair and do play solitaire. I mean, in reality, I would assume that such people also existed in your organization. Is that right? And, and how did you deal with it? It's right. They exist. No, they don't exist. I mean, for, for you guys, maybe not. Yeah, but um, but in an organization with 1,500 people, they exist. Yeah, but it's but not for, it's but, not the 80 percent. Yeah, 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 right. It's it's yeah. it's just it's just exceptions. And just because there are a few people, you know, like you, you cannot you cannot. I I think that's what that's the idea, right? So the idea is somebody will betray us so because somebody might betray us we, we create systems for all the people who do not want to betray us who, yeah. who really you know and, and 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 just to keep these these like five people to make them work and, and you make you don't make them work anyway because they you know like like sorry that i, I have to correct that because the way of how i would look at it would be so in the moment when i see somebody who is not Who's doing that? Who's play, Who's playing? I don't know games. Like, what do you think? How many? How many? How many people play games in in there? I mean, I remember that Stefan was responsible for for the Trivago community in the beginning, and our whole community consisted of like, which were hundreds and thousands of people. Was was uh, was people who were in another work relationship, but just did a lot of community work, uh, voluntary community work at uh, at Trivago, and they and they were basically not. Uh, uh, working in their real job. So what do you think, how many people sit there who sit in the real job and don't do that? You know, and, don't, and, and they're sitting in systems where people still tell them what to do and with, which are still very hierarchical and they, and they don't do anything. So it happens in both systems. But I think in the moment where you see that, I think it's a very good indicator to go to that person and say like, hey, like what's going wrong here? You know, what, 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 why is that happening? So right. so so what is it is it is it is it is that your is that your is that your is that your your your, your project leader is that your like like what what like like what's going wrong here, and I think there's no better indication in an organization than people who, who do not play with the rules basically and then or not per, per rules I hate rules but who are basically like what what you what you say there right so uh, so uh, I don't know, I, I also hate unproductive yeah but. Let's let let us let's let's take it like it is, or who, who don't create something, right? So if you take people who not create positive output, so so I think that's a good indication, and it's usually not an indication that they don't want to work. And so they that's push my you, experience. 
I think they push you to the next level. One little um, a story from this morning. Yeah? I'm leading the kindergarten um, at the moment because um, the kids have to play somehow and they need programs. So I became the assistant of the kindergarten teacher. And there's, um, there's like uh, six kids um, that, that we're watching. And one kid always wants to go home. So it's nine to 12 and she always wants to leave. And so I talked to her and I said, what do you want to do? And why do you want to go home? And she says, I want to watch TV and eat chocolate. I mean, that's basically playing solitaire, right? Um, so um, I said, uh, what's, I tried to find out, you know, why do you want to play solitaire or watch TV and eat chocolate? What's so interesting? And then um, finally um, we decided she may go home. And, but then at the end she came back. And I said, you know, I have an idea. How about we don't watch TV, but we make a movie for TV and then we show it to everybody and we make them pay chocolate for, for entry. So tomorrow we will make a movie about the place, like a crime story with all the kids and you can have my phone and you can do, and then we will cut it and we play sounds and we will make music. And she was like, really? And who's going to write the story? And I said, you're going to write the story with the other kids. And uh, she, then uh, there was this great excitement. And all the kids said, we're going to make a movie. We're going to make a movie. And everybody was running around um, to make a movie now. So um, nobody's talking about watching TV anymore, but making TV. And I think that's, um, I mean, that's playing with kids, but that's also leading an organization, I think. I mean, seriously, who wants to sit and play all day solitaire? <laughs> No, there's, like this is happening because of the circumstance because there's no sense in, in, in just being there and you need the money or you don't get you, nobody wants to do that like everyone would do something else if it's like do whatever you want here's a million in your bank account nobody would sit down and play all day solitaire so there's something significantly wrong with your organization and basically not only the organization it's the whole economy which is fucked up I mean we have so many problems so we're talking about radically transforming the economy if we don't want Want to have like a heated climate uh, we have the climate crisis we have the uh, 26 billionaires own as much as the poorest half of the world and our democracies are being fucked up by 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 everyone so like we have huge problems and uh, so we need all, all to address like what is happening and there is no purpose for people who sit there and play solitaire uh, and you need to ask the organization what did you do wrong and not the people like why are you so bored playing solitaire why are you not productive like It's, uh, We will delete it on all the computers, so you can't play solitaire anymore. <laughs> it's, it's, for, I will, for, we will, yeah. for, for Einhorn, yeah. just, just one sentence. Like for Einhorn, um, people rather leave Einhorn than just sit around and see everyone doing crazy stuff and uh, like yeah we have people we have a really small fluctuation but people leave because they say like I don't think I can contribute here um, or I'm not like and they leave. And nobody would ever think about, like, for me, it's like I, I'm too far away, like, for corporations. When you said that, I'm like, oh, who would do that? <laughs> it's like, it doesn't make sense to play solitaire. Um, it's like people want to contribute. People want to do something meaningful. And um, if it's shareholder value only, if you work, and I, I worked for Rocket Internet in the incubator for the Summer Brothers. I mean, there are a lot of people like, like that also sitting there or getting kicked out. But because there's no other purpose but... Uh, um, exiting your company and you don't contribute, you don't uh, participate to uh, that exit, so it doesn't make sense. So maybe just um, that single note. I think that was also um, a very good point on empower that empowering doesn't even or is not limited to the time people are in the organization, but also empower them to move on, right? You see a lot of companies that hold their employees um, inside, even if they feel like they cannot contribute anymore. You give them even higher salaries to no, don't, don't leave, please stay within the organization. Um, or people feel betrayed because people left the organization. So there are a lot of, um, I think this is also where empowerment plays in. I was very um, interested into the purpose topic that you just mentioned, Valdemar, because When I listen to you, then I feel like the purpose that you mean is like really creating something that is good to the world, that is making the world a better place, um, all in that direction, talking about sustainability, talking about maybe fairness, talking about um, yeah, making, making the world a better, fairer place. Um, I would say Trivago didn't have such a strong purpose in like, very obviously so how did we 
how would you say did we at Trivago inspire still people? Because I felt like a very um, inspired person, intrinsically motivated to contribute value within the organization. And um, there wasn't, for me at least, I can only talk for me, uh, not this big, um, how yeah, do which, which was, please. Well, it's because of Rolf, because uh, he, um, when he starts talking, I would jump out of the window if he tells me to, because he's fucking, he's fucking making me crazy with his uh, fantastic visions, right? No, I, I, I think I think that I think that people besides purpose, I think people are already very happy. And I, I, I think it's way better if they if they have a great purpose. I, I think though that purpose is not always I think it's building long term sustainable companies that do not harm. For me, that's already qu quite good. And um and I think that's something that people appreciate. So if people work in a company which has a long, lo long term vision, which, which is, which is um, um, trying to build something that lasts and is having a long term perspective on things. I think people appreciate that already. Yeah? Ideally, they should only work for companies like you guys. Yeah? That's what, but, but, but there's not enough. So they still appreciate, I think, long term thinking, sustainable thinking, and they still appreciate if they give, they're given room to have an impact. So that's at least my experience, yeah. So I um and and I and I think I think I think that's 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 true, um oh that's true. But that's my experience that you can create already that people appreciate if they if they get freedom if they can create impact and if they can do something which is creating something that they see, and that is creating something that is that is that is having a long time time horizon. And it's not 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 focusing on on short term profit. No. But if I have the choice, I think there should be more purpose companies. And I think if if there would be more purpose companies, I think people will have a tendency to rather work for purpose companies than for companies like Trivago. Yeah. But there's there's just uh, um, not just but probably right now not enough for people, right? And then they appreciate. I still still think what what we gave them. A quick moment of silence. Now, uh, <laughs> a lot of content and context. Um, and before we jump into the question, because there are many, many uh, very interesting questions, I think um, you, um, Stefan, you are up to up to a date with them. Um, for me, it would be interesting. How was your own one thing? How was your own journey becoming an empowering person? Um, so, so what was easy for you? What was hard for you? Um, and um, what are your, now that we have so many um, students and also people who are maybe just building their organization or will be um, organization, will be building their organization. What is somehow a bit key to start with if you want to um, create an, an empowering organization if you build it up. I have something. Mm -hmm. What we tried actually, we, we wanted everyone at Einhorn to be like more like co-entrepreneurs and not employees. So we don't even call them employees, but unicorns. So it's like, if you want to everyone be on more on an eye level and um, we don't have hierarchies anymore and we want them to be more entrepreneurs than employees, then we should actually give them all the privileges we have as entrepreneurs. And uh, that's basically what we did. We said like, we analyzed like, okay, wh what kind of privileges do we have? We can like, we can actually tell people when do we work? We can choose ourselves, like do we work on the weekends, at night or in the mornings? Do we take off from Monday to Wednesday because we need a creative break? So like being the chief of your time uh, most employees aren't. Um, so we said like everyone can pick the time where they want. Like Philip and I worked wherever we wanted. Like we can work from the train, we can work uh, from home. Um, and this seems like totally normal to entrepreneurs, but it's not to employees. So we said like, okay, you can also work and we make it possible from wherever you work. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to have all the numbers and complete transparency. So otherwise I can't expect someone to be an entrepreneur. So what we said is like, okay, 
you know what is what's our bank account you know all the salaries all the salaries are transparent all the costs you know everything we give you all the numbers not everyone wants to know all the numbers but even knowing that you could actually ask and you will get the numbers is a huge uh, uh, trust thing and uh, and we continued and at the end of course we actually handed over the company because why I'm so motivated because it's my fucking company. So okay, how can, if I want other people to be motivated and intrinsically motivated, I have to hand over the company. And if everybody owns the company, this is a complete different uh, responsibility. And I can only tell you that's my eighth company. And I failed with seven companies in a very classical content. I burned millions. Um, I fired, hired uh, a lot of <laughs> employees. Um, and I've never seen such a, such a such a level of responsibility within a company never ever it's like in at einhorn it wouldn't even come to to somebody's mind to let the, like the company hang or not make sure that we are uh, actually covered between christmas and new year's eve and somebody's answering the hotline and it's like this is i've never seen that like we are only managing directors on paper we sign like yeah okay what uh, one million tampons okay i sign here um, we just we, we just do that th these things and we completely trust the team and it's like this is really crazy and from that moment on when i realized okay you can really it's not just philip and me holding the company being responsible for everything but it's uh, up to 30 uh, unicorns who make sure this whole thing is working and the the good thing for entrepreneurs is you can now focus on the really nice stuff and not uh, telling people okay your holidays mm, can you really take holidays in that week no I, i'm not sure if you can do that you want more salary like this is the boring stuff you want to focus on stuff and uh, i mean that was the most egoistic thing philip and i could have done uh, giving away the company to itself Nice. I don't know, Philip. Do you want uh, want to to say something? You or otherwise, I would I would I would maybe jump in and and uh, because you asked, okay, like your your personal journey. I think it's pretty much like what Valdemar said. So so I mean, I came from HHL. I was very conve like I had a very conventional idea of leadership in the beginning. Um, I don't know, like Philip as well, I think, right? So I know you from mm -hmm. the beginning and, and you were very different. So, and, and, and I just had the freedom to try out a lot of stuff. And, and because I, I got the freedom to try out things, I just seen that they don't work. You know, it's not that I have, I want to create an utopia just from the start, you know? It's not that I was like this um, starting Trivago. I was just trying out other things and they did not work for me. You know, it was just not, it was just like, I, I tried to be just honest with myself. And when I was honest with myself, I, I just seen that when, in, I don't know, when you create like um, uh, 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 salaries or like, like um, um, on var variable salaries based on some bullshit KPIs, balance scorecard kind of system, you know, then, then you realize, yeah, it sounds nice, but it's just a big shit show at the end. You know, and it's just, it's just, it's just basically at the end, it's giving you the, the, the illusion of productivity. That's what's giving you. That's it. But there's not real productivity. It's just giving you an illusion of productivity. And the, the, and the, and the worst thing is that most organizations just are, are basically running on that illusion. They are just, you know, running on that foam of, of productivity. They don't run on real productivity. You know, it's just this kind of foamy productivity that people think there is. Because this, this idea is created by people who they want to get their bonuses too. So they create KPIs for other people, you know, and, 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 and so this is a huge fucked up system, you know, and, 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 and I, think, I, think, I think people who are sitting in organizations, they know that, you know, I lately talked, I, I would have loved to have like one guy, I would bring him in, the, in one of the next session if he still uh, want to do more than five. I'll bring him in the next session. Sessions, Boris, and he he was uh, he was a, uh, um, um, a reporter for for Stern, and and he uh, analyzed the, the the VW diesel scandal, and the stories that he tells about the people, like like how the information flow was was within VW, you know, and then and then and then people basically were kind of always putting responsibilities on the other people. You know, and, and, and how much value was destroyed through this kind of system where nobody at the end really had responsibility and want to take responsibility and everybody was just trying to play by the rules. 
It's insane. So, so I think our, our, our systems are, are clearly flawed and also not only morally flawed, they are also flawed when it, when it comes to productivity, you know? So, so, so yeah, sorry, I'm, 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 so with you guys, somehow I, I'm getting more into my rent models, but that is really, <laughs> more really like that. Please it's awesome. Um, the, the other talks will probably be very different. Life. You also wanted to share your, your, your- um, uh, my, my, my personal <laughs> story. Yeah. Or, or, no, or my, my tip, right? So, so my tip is, so what we're trying to do with Leadership Sprouts now, so as an, as an MVP, is basically um, we try to create a room for entrepreneurs to, to grow themselves and to grow their organization. And, and we think that this is super, super necessary because we think that due to the uh, pressure of capital, uh, venture capital and so on, Uh, we, we think that um, entrepreneurs barely, they, they don't take the time themselves and they don't get this kind of room that, to, 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 uh, to evolve. And the most important things about evolving personalities is you can only evolve if you give yourself some slack, if you give yourself some room. If you're just running in your business and you're doing day in and day out, just operations and just the next thing and so on, you will never you will never have the chance to improve yourself. So you really have to take time, take a step back, climb on a tree, get some perspective, right? And, 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 and that's super, super important. So really taking this, this room for self-development. And I think the same is true for an organization. Giving your organization room, space to evolve, to, 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 to find out new things. And the moment where you do that, at the end, you end up where Philip and Waldemar are. I'm pretty sure if you're fast enough and if you're consequent enough that, like they are, you will probably end up there. But you need, you need to, you start, have to start with giving yourself some room to, be, to evolve and, 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 and not just stay on your super kind of focus way that you, you, you define performance for yourself, that you define career for yourself, that you define success for yourself. I think in the moment where you get perspectives, I think it work, will work out for you. Um, probably the hard thing about that is um, it uh, doesn't always feel great. You know, um, if you do your chores, if you do the KPIs, if you follow the numbers, if you have a nice chart and a presentation and then your revenues just go up, that's something that society will always make a check on it and say, you did a good job because everybody does it like this. Um, and sometimes with all this open space on your lonely tree sitting there thing, trying to get a perspective, but everything is full of trees around you, um, it can get very frustrating. So um, I sometimes really wish myself back, Valdemar um, knows that, that um, sometimes we're on the phone and I'm like, can we just launch another pro uh, uh, like product? Can we just do like, I don't know, deodorant or toilet paper and just stop with all this, but uh, just go back down the tree and then do a product and then, then go back on the tree. So um, it really, uh, it's not very comfortable there. Um, it's really weird. Um, and you can end up in um, comedy shows. How do you keep yourself there? So how do you resist of not going back to um, easy answers or less complexity? Well, um, it's a ping pong, right? Because um, What I said uh, about the, uh, the kindergarten thing, this is also super inspiring. So working on things makes you experience new stuff, but um, it has to be your free will. So if uh, I would want to build a chair now, maybe building the chair, I have the best idea um, how to build um, something new to the company um, or how to inspire somebody. But um, if, if I would be in the normal daily operations business of Einhorn um, or a normal company even, um, I would never be outside here um, looking for children um, or building a chair. That would be absolute madness. So I think that's kind of the perspective where you can do whatever you want and then you just follow this kind of flow. You will always find new things um, out there. I mean, I, I hope this is not made up, Philip. I, I trust you because this is such an amazing story. The like kid the, story. The, the, the no, kid story. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's such it's... an amazing, and because because it's it's also I think a very good example because it, it, even if I'm not sure like if you spend there now a week or a month or whatsoever, but the insight that 
the, the insight that you got already just from this one episode, right? Just this insight is already worth it. And I think that's, that's what people have to understand, create creativity and evolving. That doesn't happen on a time scale. It's not that you could sit down, read a book and basically, and then, then it happens. Sometimes for a long time, nothing happens, you know, and then you could get an insight. But if you don't give yourself the room, this insight will not come. And, 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 th and then you cannot evolve in your, in your view of the world, in the view of managing the complexity of this world, understanding the world in, in its holistically. You, you cannot get there if you don't give yourself the room. And, and I think what you do, do there was amazing. So I, I, I'm, I'm probably not doing that often enough. I should do that more. Yeah. Well, more there's a lot of kids here who need to be looked out for. So yeah. if you're very happy to come and play kindergarten, it's great for yeah. ideas. I, I think also what's helped Einhorn is like completely challenging the status quo. And uh, it's, it's, and that's not some, something you write in the walls, like everyone wants to challenge the status quo. No, really <laughs> challenging the status quo and saying like, what are we doing here? And I'm really afraid of you guys, like a hundred uh, business students now here, how are you going to enter the world and what kind of thinking um, will you bring out there and in corporations and startups and so on? It's like really, it's so, so important what you think and what you do, because like we are, or I'm like, I studied international business and uh, it's like, we were all following the dogma of uh, Milton Friedman. It's like 50 years ago, this was a pretty radical idea of uh, only optimizing shareholder value only. This was radical back then, and it's like, uh, and, and some some people like uh, Thatcher and Reagan, they took the idea for granted and they established it, and we, we got very good at that game. But now we realize that game somehow destroyed our planet, and uh, people are fighting all over. Somehow that doesn't work. So we need to change that that dogma, and uh, the so we need to challenge everything, and that helps because that's what we did with Einhorn. We were so frustrated with all the startups and uh, VC money, whatever what we did before. Um, that we said like we need to challenge everything we don't take anything for granted anymore so we do rather bad things and other things than than doing the same things we have done before um, and this helped a lot so really challenge all of that everything what is what they tell you at the university i hope of course at adhl they tell you different stuff but most uh, business students they get told shitty stuff i was told shitty stuff which is not you can't take do anything with it anymore it's just stupid everything is just theoretical it's the only science i think which is not the real science so don't believe it. it's like you need to do try think uh, and test stuff and give yourself room and slack like rolf said it's it's different times there's no one else fucking corona who could have thought it's, it's everything is completely crazy it's like this this ball How do you how do you call this ball uh, like uh, in Germany this is where there's like a uh, snow inside and when you like shake it then it's all over mm -hmm. what's it called in English I have no clue snowball. snowball a snow globe yeah snow globe yeah it's like that snow globe everything is crazy and you, sometimes you need time and let it rest so it goes down and you see a clear picture wow wow it's a record right amazing oh, I love that <laughs> <laughs> and with this we open up the question round right yes uh, thank you very much um just for brevity there are very three small questions that i would like to ask you and everybody if you feel that you want to participate and your question haven't been answered please raise your hand and we try to bring you up stage um uh, three quick questions three short answers um salary uh, coming back to that um How, how did you actually do it? I mean, how did you help people to understand what salary they should be having? Uh, as you said, um, at Einhorn, everything was, is transparent and you decide self on your own salary. How did it work? Well, you measure the performance with uh, KPIs and then based on a, a score that... Um, no, that's... Um, oh, I don't believe you right now. No, that's it's also... It was a joke. Um, Well, um, at the beginning, it was all um, free flow. And then uh, Waldemar found the Gehaltsrat, which is like um, people voted by the team who, um, who help you find your right salary. And then there's like, um, I think it's triple or four times Waldemar, the salary. Um, it's like the minimum salary is 2,500 or 2,700. And then the maximum salary is four times the minimum salary so that the 
I think it's four times now, right? Yes. And then, so there's not such a big wage gap for like, wouldn't make any sense if we give away the company and then we get a hundred times what, uh, what somebody else in the company, that would be weird. Um, so um, it's like four times and then there's big kind of, um, so you can't decide everything. So if you start as a junior, then you get the minimum and then you say, this is my experience and this is what I did. And then you kind of negotiate, but you don't negotiate with uh, Valdemar and me but you negotiate with the team you will work with and with the Gehaltsrat. Okay, thanks. A second uh, uh, very operative question. This holiday experiment, uh, um, I would say, how much holidays are people taking? I, 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 have, I have that experience myself. I used to work in another corporate company, I would say, and they also had free holidays, take whatever you want to. And my experience was, everybody ended up more or less with something between four to six weeks. Some a little bit more, some a little bit less, but nobody was really taking uh, too much advantage of that. How was your experience? Well, I, I can just tell you my experience. My experience was in the beginning, um, on, on a global level, holidays even went down because I was not understanding the concept right. And then basically we said, okay, everybody has to take at least this amount of holiday. So that's a minimum that everybody has to take. You can take more, but that's a minimum. And, and to be co completely, I mean, I, I just heard some legends of people who were taking really lots of holidays, maybe Anna knows better, but I did not want to look at it anymore. So I, after that moment, I stopped and said, I don't want to make it a factor in my decision if now if now people take 30 40 whatsoever days of holiday so that's why i said i forbid myself to look at it yeah i i think it's very important to lead by example also with uh, unlimited amount of holidays so philip and i are just taking holidays all the time um and that's very important like, because like i think netflix has the same thing going on but they fire the last uh, 10 percent who are not performing well and of course nobody <laughs> takes holidays then even if it's uh, unlimited um, <laughs> i didn't so, know that that's funny and uh, yeah you have to to show and still we have the problem i think we don't know exactly how much holidays they take because we don't uh, measure that but we lead by example and sometimes we have to make sure because it more feels like a family we have people who say like okay this guy again doesn't take holidays at all so we need to like enforce it and uh, and send him to on holidays because he can't handle for for whatever so but that's only a few uh, people and the other ones actually um, are really happy that they can actually also adjust holidays um, to their lifestyle. I mean, we all in different life situations. Like when we when became when became older and people got kids, it's completely different, um, and you need to adjust as a as a company to that, and uh, completely trust trust the people. So until until now, like very very good experiences. It's it's also funny because people always think like with the salary they think um, like the, the it's. People believe, I think that kind of, or some people believe, for example, I think Hans, um, um, and also I know that uh, Stefan, um, they think that people are basically a little bit evil inside, you know, if you, uh, if you make them choose, if you let them choose, they will, they will take the bad choice. You yourself, you wouldn't, of course, you would do the right thing. You wouldn't take so many holidays. <laughs> you wouldn't take the highest salary, but the others, you know, they are a little bit bad. You know, um, and we talked to this um, a lot with Gats Werner, you know, the founder of the M, um, and he always said, you know, you, you the, the, these, um, they, they have a picture of themselves as humans and um, of the other people, they are a little like animals. And that's what people think also with the uh, unconditional basic um, income. People think, well, I would, I would go on working and be productive, but my neighbor, you know, he would just do nothing and everybody would go bankrupt because Everybody except me is like my neighbor and he's lazy, you know, as fuck. Um, and I think this, um, that's funny. If you, if you track these things, you know, the, the coolest thing um, to empower people is like we have somebody in the company, she works her ass off. She doesn't want to take holidays and she's always involved in all the projects and she's super responsible. And, but we felt like, it was too much. She needed a break because sometimes you just need a break, climb on a tree or on a beach and then relax. And then you come back 
And it's better. People who are rested work better. They just perform better. Um, so we told her, can you yeah. please go on holidays? And she said, well, maybe I can go for a week. And we said, no, you have to go for three weeks. Please go just for three weeks. And she was, are you crazy? And uh, I can't do that. And the project, and then she went on holiday for three weeks and she came back and said, best decision ever. Um, and now she makes everybody go on holidays too. And it's also, um, <clears throat> as, um, <laughs> maybe team Gründerin Klasse, that was her. Um, and we talked to her about that um, um, Uh, yesterday and she said really there's somebody in my team and I really want to send her on holiday can I do that and we were like yes of course tell, um, tell everybody to go on holiday because it's great um, to have a holiday sometimes it won't ha hurt the company people who can go on holidays they come back happy because you trust them to, to do that mm -hmm. I, I mean two, two things first for, um, so I also think it's it's weird that we talk about so like what do you think like people take 30 days or they take 60 or whatsoever right let's let's say they take 30 days more than you would expect that's about 10 percent in a year so we really speak about like a 10 percent increase if if this would be product productivity which is of course not right but if it would be productivity it would be a 10 percent increase or decrease of productivity 30 days so when, when we speak about intrinsic motivation or not intrinsic mo motivated, we speak about three to 10 X. That's where the value is. Not in the 10%, it's in the 300. And, and also the 10%, maybe you see something else of the world and you come closer to yourself yeah, and you find love and you find inspiration and you get creative on holidays. Then you come back with a new idea that you wouldn't have had in front of your desk playing solitaire all day long. <laughs> <laughs> no, people, so, so I, I think a res uh, the responsibility of a company or of a leader in a company is to tell people where they should take, ho to take holidays. They should push them basically to say, take a rest, take some slack, take, go, go, and, go and, on, and, and educate yourself or whatsoever, do something. So I think that's our responsibility. It's not our responsibility to make people work. They work for themselves. Our responsibility is to, to give them the slack basically to grow and to, to rest and to, 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 and, and to do that because that is sometimes way harder. So you, there was once a question about the, the, the small little projects, you know, like who does them, you know, if everybody wants to do big projects. Actually, that's not my experience. What I saw at least was that people were loving the small little sh shit basically because that is something where they see directly, okay, wow, I create, I create something, I do something. And, and you had rather, you have to convince them to do the big projects. So that's, yeah. that's, that's what that's you have the to shredding. for. The shredding inspire, is cool. Yes. Inspire them for the big things, right? That is, that's what a company should do or a leader. Okay. Um, maybe let's ask uh, one or two people from the audience to come up. Uh, we had Shivani who had an answer that was not addressed yet uh, on empowerment and feedback. Shivani, if you unmute yourself and ask a question, that would be great. Hello, everyone. I'm Shivani from the Full-Time MBA program. Uh, I would love to know your perspective on feedback, because when you want your teams to be empowered and people to be empowered, uh, it's also very important to give direct critical feedback. So how do you manage that part? Who wants to start? You guys? Well, I can also... We... I... Okay, you start. No. You start. No, you start. No, oh. you start. No, you start. Okay. No, you start. Um, I, I think I think it's super. I, I think it's super hard to give honest feedback, and it's super super important. And um, and there there's a lot of different ways you can do it. And um, and I think it's I think I, I for myself believe it's important to have it in a structured way because I think it's another thing that a company or a leader should take care of that people give each other feedback that there is a transparency about about things and 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 I think that is also I think one of the, the for me the biggest and imp most important ob obligations of a of a leader to to make that sure you know that people giving each other honest feedback but but feedback I think it's important that it's really not from one person only so if you if you get feedback you should get feedback from a broader group of people I think that's very important Because the, 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 I think what most people do not understand with feedback, feedback 
might be when I get feedback, it might be a little bit about myself, yes, but it's also a lot about the other person who's giving me feedback. Yeah, that's something that we found out. So when we looked at, for example, how people, so we let everybody evaluate everybody, but no, not anonymously, basically, and everybody gave everybody feedback, right? They wrote nice, a nice text, what they could improve and what they're, what they're good at and bad at. And, um, and um, but, but the problem is when you have just one person, you can see the feedback they give is a reflection of themselves. So if you really want to have feedback, there is, there is no way, in my opinion, uh, um, around getting feedback from a lot of people, aggregating the feedback, and then having ideally a facilitator who works with you through that feedback. Yeah, so I think that's very important. If you want to have really good information, and, and, and but, but I think I think it's it's elementary, and 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 I, I think up to the up to the last day I was there, I think not the whole organization understood how important this is and how important this process is because there were of course a lot of leaders complaining. They were always saying, "Oh, we have a way too complex system. We way we have we have." Once, once a year, a week, we only give feedback and so on. And you expect us to give feedback continuously and blah, 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 and always giving feedback, you know? And but I think this is the most important thing that you can do. You help your people to grow, right? You really help your people to, de to evolve. And, and what we have seen is we, 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 people evolved and they were just able to, to, to manage themselves better. They were better able to inspire others. And, 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 and you have to give people the room to evolve. Yeah, sorry. Maybe Anna, just maybe you can also say like three words, like a little bit about like how you you felt it, and and because I think that. Yeah, I mean, I can maybe I can share it from a perspective where I entered Trivago and the first time I I received a three hundred and sixty degree feedback, um, in this organization. I think it was in the beginning completely overwhelming to me because. The feedback that we are used to get um, is either it's rather too nice. It just tells you twice, oh, I like this about you. And I also like this about you and you didn't do your job. You know, like there is no really constructive way of a giving feedback. You've never learned this before and also no constructive way on receiving feedback. So yeah, often you go into a defensive mode and you say, okay, yeah, this person said this, but it's then it's not true to me, uh, whatever. Um, <clears throat> because we are all trained to be perfect and we all should be perfect and um, every mistake and everything you do not good is bad. Um, and I think, so the first most important thing I felt <clears throat> was to have this safe space where I could receive also an, negative input or you know critical feedback what you just said uh, and and perceive it as something constructive so that's the first thing i think it helped very much that it was um, um, aggregated feedback so i knew not only one person had this perception but it had like oh 30 people think that you should be improving on that side then you maybe you, you give it a thought um, and and um, the third point was that it was a really, really an in-depth conversation. So it was not just a report that I would be getting and then I would make my own way through this feedback, but there was a true conversation on how I perceive myself, what I, how I feel about, you know, um, what, what, what are my strengths, what are my improvement areas, and then going into kind of the, the observation of others and then together, <clears throat> in this conversation, uh, conversation making sense out of it, and then you know defining for yourself what you actually want to improve. So as you see, it's not just like this. Okay, there, there, there is feedback or not feedback, but the whole process behind facilitating um, constructive feedback. I think this is what made it so critical to me and important to me and. Um, I think I've never received so much feedback before and I I was truly I was truly kind of moved by how much people care about you and your development and I think if you can establish that 
that safe space and that people really want, they don't give you feedback because bad feedback or they don't give you critical feedback because they don't like you because there is this elbow, you know, um, uh, um, environment, because, but they want to develop you. They want to, you know, support you and your development. And this is something that is quite um, powerful. I think most most people would need some kind of uh, feedback license to give feedback. So just like a driving license, yeah. um, and most like it. It I think in most feedback talks are just harming organizations and and people because people are not able to communicate. And we all think we can communicate. Well, I don't think we communi We are able to communicate because we never learned that. We never learned that in kindergarten school. Um, and I'm not just saying like putting words out of your mouth, but really communication between people is something completely different, which we had to learn and still learning the hard way. Um, so we're, for example, big fans of nonviolent communication. Um, it's, um, it's a special system. It has nothing to do actually with violence, a stupid name, but it's very important actually to see what are the needs of people. Because the needs of people are pretty much similar, but the strategies we choose to articulate these, uh, these needs are pretty stupid. And that's why we get caught up in gossip, burnout, mobbing, um, and so on. So we should actually be really careful um, who gives feedback. Um, and I, I've never met people from regular companies. It's like, yeah, I'm looking forward to my yearly feedback talk. Woo! -hoo -hoo. No, everybody hates that. And I hate it myself. I had a, a few employments myself. It's just stupid. It's like, yeah, you really did that. I think there's a term for that sandwich, something. I think like you cover it, as, you start with something nice, and but you're always waiting for the, for the big uh, thing to come. And then you round up with something nice again, sandwich feedback or something. Um, no, so I'd rather tell people not to give feedback uh, before you have a communication license. Um, to, yeah, like nonviolent communication is one, one tool you could use, which we use at Einhorn. People tend to be very overreaching in feedback often. Uh, that's what I said in the beginning with uh, that it's telling you a lot about the person itself. You know, people are usually like, like that, you usually have a tendency to overreach into the perception of the person, right? So, and, and, and that is, is really, is really dangerous because you don't know how this other person feels and thinks and, and, and how much effort they put in. And you might think they don't put effort into it and they put a lot of effort into it. And then you, then you just destroy, destroy them completely. And you, if you, if you want to be on a capitalistic side, you just completely destroy their, uh, their productivity as well. Not that only them as a human being, but also their productivity with it. Um, there's a, a trick um, we like to use, or at least um, I'm using it with uh, with Matze, who I do the podcast with. Um, and also I, I use it with Waldemar and some people in the company who are listening to the podcast are using it with me too now. And we call it kind of the gearbox. So um, if somebody calls me, sometimes you're working on a, on a, uh, on a project and then... Um, people need feedback you know they they want to know what you think but sometimes it's hard to ask because you will get a very critical opinion and you know oh philip is very critical if somebody's making like an ad or something um, if i call him he will completely destroy it um, so they can't really ask me and get uh, to my skills because they're scared it will take them a lot of time to build everything in that i am um, expect so um, to get this, we have this gearbox. So um, when, when people call me to ask for feedback, they, they tell me what they want to know and they show me. And then I say, how do you want my feedback? Like how many days do you have to, to process it? Um, how important is the project to you? How, um, how good do you think it is like on your scale? Do you think it's 80%? And because if they think it's 80% and I tell them it's bullshit, it will just hurt their feelings. So um, I think that's, and, and it's also really helps if they think it's 80% and I think, oh yeah, I think it's 80% too, then you're talking about the same thing. So it's about establishing kind of the same room. Um, it happened, I don't know if you um, heard about this Olympic stadium thing and that we rented um, to do the, like the biggest de democracy party of all times. And then um, it was super successful. And then um, a lot of criticism happened and then we did it. And then Corona happened and then 
um, it was all shut down and we um, donated uh, all the people donated part of the money but the rest was given back um, so it was uh, crazy crowdfunding and everything was documented so there's a movie about we thought that the end of the movie would be <laughs> the stadium full of people and celebrating like a great day but it was all about the criticism after and then how it got blown off by Corona and then the two idiots um, uh, trying uh, to deal with this so um, parts of the team watched this, um, this, this show and of, it's very emotional, you know, we tried to not cut out too many things um, we get very vulnerable because we thought it's important also for men to show vulnerability and to be, um, you know, to, um, to be able to, to show that you did shit and then you changed and that it's, it's possible to evolve in a short period of time. So, People saw it and then Jan Böhmermann got all over it and, um, uh, and was tearing it up on Twitter. Um, and somebody from the team, I said, well, what do you think about it? And then he said, well, it's, the show is really cringy. You know, it's, I, couldn't, I couldn't really watch it. And I was like, what part do you mean? And he was like, you know, this part where you dance with Charlotte Roche, just like out of nothing, like on the street, just dancing out on the street. That's really weird. And that was really cringy. And then I kind of, I left and I felt really horrible. I was really um, kind of smashed because I was just dancing because I was kind of expressing my joy out there open, you know, for everybody to see. And then somebody tells me what you're doing is really fucking embarrassing, you know, it's horrible. And then I told this to Waldemar and he said, well, you know from where this comes, right? He would never do that. So how can you value this feedback so much? Why does it hurt you? And I learned a lot about feedback in that moment because a lot of feedback really, like Rolf said, and also Anna, um, people tell you something they wouldn't do so, um, and that they are afraid of. So if you get feedback from people who are scared of the stuff that you do, they will not empower you, but they will stop you from uh, doing the things that you're good at. And that's very dangerous feedback, I think. So choose wise. And I which think pill very, do you want? And I think very, very nice uh, ending words. Um, we are over our time that we promised um, to take uh, today. Um, and uh, we will come back to the Hippocratic pledge, Philip. I reach out to you. Well, we have unlimited time for this uh, Hippocratic pledge. So if you want to talk about this, you heard that time is a relative um, item for us. We don't track anything. Um, so if you want to go into this now, Stefan, um, we are here for you, of course, to do like a um, creative session. But uh, we, we can do that. I'm very happy to do that. But uh, for everybody else who, who put 90 minutes for this in, in your calendar and you have to uh, meet other obligations, maybe family, job or self-realization. Solitaire. Solitaire as well. Um, uh, I would say thank you at this stage of time. <laughs> um, but uh, if, if you want to stay longer, we can stay longer. Um, that's, that's great. So, but first of all, thank you very much uh, to everybody who has a tight schedule and uh, needs to leave now. Thanks um, for your questions and sorry we didn't answer all of them. Yeah. Right. Um, Due to time. Um, but there's a book out there if you want to read more. Some, there's a book called Unfuck the Economy. Oh, I didn't yeah. drop that yet. There's, everything is book. in detail. Unfuck the Economy. I don't link, know what the, link, please. Yeah. It's on the Einhorn website. Um, okay. Hi Hippocratic Pledge. So now we're moving I, topics, guys. We're not just. Uh, you, you cannot leave. They don't let I'm, you leave. I really have to leave because I have I have to I had to have make an appointment right now, but um, but uh, I, I just want to say it was really really nice talking to you. It's always I enjoy so much to have you, uh, and and to 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 uh, you know, it, often it's it's nice to also discuss controversial, but sometimes it's just like super nice to rant and uh, and and to rant about the same things, and that's what happened today. So. Um, so I think it was really cool uh, to, ha to have you uh, here. Well, Rolf, just to um, have your opinion on this, if you, there would have been like a hypocritical eye for uh, business students at the HHL, would you have been interested in that? 
Or weren't you that far evolved by then? I was not. But I think that people today are way, way further than I am. And, and I think I, I, would, I would give them the opportunity and maybe we find a way how people, I don't know, uh, at, at least, at least could, could, could say that dedicate time also to their personal development. I think that would be also important. Yeah. So, so um, besides, because, because I think what you don't want also is you don't want people to say now, okay, you know, I, I don't know, I want to be super sustainable and so on. And then they, 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 they break it, right? Because they, they, they do it because of a peer pressure or whatsoever, right? So I think, I think sometimes people, you have to give people the slack that they develop there themselves. I don't know how you can put this into a structure, but I love the idea because I think that's really what we need. We cannot just, I think we need that people see that and that people, people decide for it and that people are open about it and they like like you wanted to have the pledge for for like the the entrepreneurs um uh i sorry i mix this always up entrepreneurs pledge is not the right thing right but it's the right thing okay <laughs> there are like several out there but um they want you you want to do the entrepreneurs pledge why should not students then also pledge that this is what they strive for you know in the long run you know i think i think maybe you can be a bit more forgiving than with the doctors but at least at least say we strive for it you know and 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 give and give some create some visibility for it for the process also yeah i would be all up for it Thanks and so maybe would be up for it to support maybe, this with the leadership sprouts. yes yeah. yes i would be up for it to support it with leadership sprouts and maybe we can also i don't know the idea um, to everybody um, who's not too familiar with it, um, Philip and Waldemar. Well, if you can, thank you. That was I'm, great. I'm sorry. You have I'm, to, I'm sorry. You have to really, jump. I get, I really but get... that was great um, to have you. Anna, can you stay? I can stay. Cool. Bye, Rolf. Ta -ta. Tschüss, Rolf. Cool. Bye, bye. Thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, um, um, quick quick summary for, for those of you still in uh, over 60 people. Wow, uh, staying with us. Um, well, they are super motivated, you know. Yeah, uh, Philip Valdemar, I don't know because that accelerate session I was not attending. I don't. I think you were both there. You rocked the stage, uh, and you put up this idea, which, <laughs> which I got many emails afterwards. Then I think it was two years ago. Um, hey guys, you and and let me rephrase what what I was told. You kick ass, hardcore, profit maximizing uh, business students out there. Is that everything? Shouldn't we actually have different goals in life? And wouldn't it be cool to have something like an Hippocratic Oath uh, for business students? And why, why shouldn't HGL start with that? If, if I recall that directly, but, but you know more about the, the idea that you put forward, uh, maybe you can talk about it a little bit. Well, uh, Valdemar is, I think, preparing some kind of uh, survey or something. So I will, uh, I will jump in quickly. Um, so, you know, all medical students, they do this hypocritical, hypocritic oath, oath I, I put uh, where they promise not to do harm to, um, to the living. And it totally makes sense, like from the old perspective that, that we all deal with. So people treating other people shouldn't harm them. And you should be able to trust your doctor. So if you go to, to the doctors and um, you would know, well, he hurts people for money, um, that would be bad. So um, they, couldn't, they couldn't go on working. But um, as times evolved, doctors aren't um, the only people who can harm people, um, but it's much more the management uh, and the people who really studied, um, for example, law or, um, or business. So... Um, why isn't there a Hippocratic Oath for business students? Um, because you're like doctors to the economy, you know? You um, work with people, you give the feedback, you um, make them, you empower them or you don't. Um, you can push them down or you can rise them up. So uh, shouldn't there be like some kind of course at university or like, a, I don't know, a diploma or like a little add-on where you can go out on stage and you get your normal diploma, but then you say, you know, I'm one of those Hippocratic students. I want to pledge an oath to do good for society and um, to empower others and to lift people up. And I de declare this by this um, declaration 
and then you come on kind of a website and if you don't then people i don't know can write or complain i don't know i don't know what they do to doctors but that what was kind of the concept that they're that you carry such a great power and within that you know that from spider-man such a great responsibility and then maybe there should be some kind of Hippocratic oath for business students. So what do you think about that? Let me hear your feedback, please. That's addressed to you guys still in the call. Hey, I might just jump in and say a word about it. Um, I really like the idea. I think that's um, really great. I've heard it for the first time just then. Um, my question about this would be that there's a lot about a lot of criticism about the Hippocratic eye the doctors have to pledge these days because it's actually a bit outdated. For example, it says that you can't really um, do an abortion. Uh, so we would have to have an hypocritic eye that is that makes it possible to still move with time. So it's not scripted and has to stay the same way, but has to be as agile as our world is today, I suppose. So that would be my idea for that. Just wanted to put that out there. But thank you so much. It was so interesting today. Um, I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Of course, it has to be super agile because you don't want to take away the freedom, of course, but you want to set some like core values to what business means. Would also be good for the, you know, the reputation of students coming from HHL. Everybody knows, oh, don't they have that Hippocratic Oath over there? So that's good people, right? They do good yeah, things. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not even at HLI. I just saw this online and jumped in. So, oh, cool. um, but I'm from a different business school, so I, I still liked it. So I joined in today. <laughs> well, maybe you can uh, you can convince there. your dean if HHL moves too fast. I mean, that's how business goes, right? I will. <laughs> we no, make a movement out of it. It it actually, I mean, why why I think um, it is interesting as well is because it it pretty much goes along with the DNA of HHL. I mean, we have the Ehrbare Kaufmann, the honorable merchant. Mm -hmm is part of our logo, has been for over 100 years. Um, and, and we do a lot of teaching. We saw in the chat uh, a reference to Andrea Suchanek, um, our business ethics professor. So, so we actually do quite some, some much stuff on that. Uh, we have an honor code in, internally, but the honor code, Philip, you would love it. The current one is all, always, you are bad. And this is how we're gonna punish you if you deviate from the honor code. <laughs> we are revising it as we speak. Right, we don't want to have such an honor code, uh, but uh, currently it's written like that. It, it's 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 assuming that somebody will defect, will do something bad, and then we will punish that person. And and I think the other way around makes makes much more sense. Um, and and actually, it's something that at business schools, at universities at large, we have to relearn. Um, you and Valdemar, you stressed a couple of times that we are taught from the first day of kindergarten. We are taught to comply. These are the rules, this is the hierarchy, this is what you have to do and this is what you don't have to do. And we've seen that with the, with the implementation of the bachelor's studies, the Bologna process in Europe, that, I mean, when I studied, there was a year, the first year I was lost. I had no idea what I was doing. I was looking for people that I saw on the first day. I was following them because I thought maybe they know how it works and they go to the classes that I should be visiting because I had no idea where to get the information. And, and, and there was half a year where I just did nothing because I didn't want to go into statistics. But these days you leave school, you come to the university first day, you get your, your weekly schedule. I mean, <clears throat> you, you unlearn learning, you unlearn thinking. And I, and I think something like an, an, a pledge needs reflection. You need to be able to know, let, let's be a little bit pathetic, good from bad to, to understand what is good, what is bad, what is against the pledge, what is good for society and what not. And, and th th this you need to discuss, you need to reflect. It's, it's not given to you. And that is, I think, a, a mistake we do in higher education that we assume 
the people coming to us to study to know more than they actually do these days. And, and I well, don't that, mean this in a bad way. I mean it- in No, no, I, I see you entering the subject. So that's always, uh, always great. Um, and Juan Carlos and Shivani, before we take you on, um, I think that's kind of intersectional leadership. You know, that's um, if you know your privilege, if you know about structural racism, about ableism, about sexism, about poverty um, and worldwide problem, if you learn these things and then you teach intersectional leadership, so knowing your privilege and how to uh, empower others to get into a position of privilege, but also knowing their privilege and sharing your power instead of building your power on, on the hierarchies, that would be um, dismantling like kind of bad hierarchies and also dismantling patriarchy, of course, and kind of substituting this, we punish you, but we understand our privilege and we value you and we want you to grow. And if you do wrong, that means probably you don't know different and we will help you. Um, that's kind of the, the vibe I would like. Who was first, Shivani or Juan Carlos? It goes in the order of appearance, Shivani. It was actually Juan, so. Ooh. Okay. So you're up. Oh, who's up, me or Shivani? No, Juan Carlos. JC, please. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was the one who mentioned Professor Suchanek in the chat because oh. um, it was one of the very first uh, classes at HHL. And he said that time, you know, the first thing he, st he starts his, cl his class with is do no harm, right? It's this sentence really, really big on the screen. And on the last day of class, he said that sometime you will be in a position in a company where you will have to actually do what others expect from you and not exactly what you think is right and no doing, not doing harm to people, right? So this goes in the lines of the system that uh, uh, um, Valdemar and you um, talk about. And regarding the, this um, oath that you just mentioned, um, I just read some weeks ago, there was a study about people who had a picture of their family on their desk at work. And according to this study, people who did have such a picture, they were less propensed to take actions at work that would harm other people. So thinking about this Hippocratic oath, I mean, doing it like, I don't know if like you suggested a kind of a diploma or supplement, I don't know, but having this kind of mental picture, it's, it would probably be enough to, at the moment of taking these decisions, like think, hey, this is not what I signed for, right? And it would be like a kind of um, mental um, break to taking bad actions. So I, I really, really like the idea. I think that uh, the, the picture um, metaphor also is fantastic because um, if, you, if, you talk, like, if you talk about feminism um, to men who, uh, who are sexist and you tell them, well, you have a mother, right? and you have probably have a daughter and you have sisters. So why would, you, um, why would you be sexist? Why would you be against feminism? And then they, they realized, oh shit, like um, the, the, the person who gave birth to me is a woman and we are, um, we are, we are not equal in, by law. So that must be a mistake. And I think that's the same thing as putting like a family picture up because you, you immediately get its people harmed that you are connected to if you make bad decisions. Sorry, Shivani, I needed to let that out. So can I go ahead? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay. So this is actually related to what uh, Juan just said, uh, do no harm. I, uh, we, I had the ethics class today as well, and I was discussing this with my professor. Uh, usually in organizations, sometimes we see that, you know, this person is not right for our team or is doing something that we want to flag to the leadership. And in my personal uh, experience, I have seen those people. But and although I came from a team which was very independent, I was very empowered. My boss is kind of my friend till date. He's still my friend till date. And we discuss things. 
but I still felt so bad that I cannot flag this person. He will get fired. Uh, I also knew that, it, that he's actually doing more harm to the team. Uh, so although, you know, this, we are talking empowerment today, you, you create those empowered people, but those people may still not have enough empowerment to go ahead and, you know, raise uh, these issues about other people because they do not want to harm those people. They do not want them to get fired. Are, you know, because it's emotionally impacting you as well at certain point. So how do you guys as leaders, you know, solve this problem that, you know, if you see something bad, you have to report it. How do you personally support that person who is uh, looking forward to report something uh, they have seen? Um, you, you want me to answer that? Yeah, both of you. Um, so I think, um, Anna, you want to go first? I can go first and I think it's a very um, it's a tricky question um, and I can bit, um, share my experiences as I have been um, working in the culture team at Trivago and somehow the culture team was also always the team that uh, was um, if there were reports uh, was getting those reports mm, and I think I think already like kind of defining what or the what the consequences are or are not um, kind of leads to whether people feel comfortable reporting it to you or not. So the way how you deal with the information, the way how you deal with the person that is reporting something to you, the way how transparent you are also with this person about a potential process or not process um, has high impact on whether people feel empowered to actually speak up against something. And um, so, so yeah, that was my learning actually to a, again, we come back to creating a safe space where people can speak up and come up, also speak up without feeling that they would be, um, would be responsible for something bad that happens to another person. Um, and being very transparent about um, certain processes that are clear and also certain um, processes that, that are flexible and are happening within a conversation or um, yeah, um, what is happening next, next steps. So, so for us, it was the kind of creating a system where you would not be afraid or you shouldn't be afraid about speaking up and there would be no direct consequences to you. And, and there would be kind of a space where we discuss what will be happening with this information moving forward. And I really liked what Philip just said is, if you go in with this perspective that actually we can now support this person in whatever way who did something wrong or whatever was the case, right? Support this person and say, okay, Maybe he didn't know better or she didn't know better. And maybe now we have a chance to change that. And you know, then you rather maybe have the impression that you help this person and that instead that you damage this person by reporting it. So kind of changing that yeah, perception. I think that's like how you said it, um, it's deep rooted in our society. If you do wrong, you get punished. Mm -hmm. But people who do wrong, are not always bad people. And um, I, I don't know if you, um, there's a book out there um, from Rutger Brechmann. He wrote Utopia for Realists. And then uh, the new book is like Im Grunde Gut, in English maybe basically good. So it's about human beings actually trying to do the right thing, but failing at that sometimes. And that our structures always, that's also what Rolf said, um, like, you have this 1% of maybe, I don't know, people who play solitaire and you punish the 99% the who actually do good work and you, you build the rules for the 1% who fail you or kind of who don't play by the rules. Um, and there's one big chapter about prison systems, which is like the ultimate form of punishment um, from a hierarchy um, of the state. So if you do something wrong, you go to prison. End of story. And there was um, there's, there's, there was two different prison systems offered actually to the to the United States when Nixon was still on. And the the other system, like the system they have now, is like 
It's crazy races. It's super overcrowded. It's super expensive. And everybody who goes into prison comes back and they stay criminals. So they don't, um, they don't heal. They don't get better. They don't get educated, but they will go back to prison. And it's like a 60 or 70% chance. So it's horrible for society. Um, it doesn't change anything. The other prison is the prison you have in Norway um, and also in the Netherlands, I think. Um, they have no prisons. So they have basically, they have like facilities where people learn together and they talk to each other and they have therapy and they get educated and they work together and they get like, um, they have social workers and they get another chance in life and they go out and they never go in again because they, they don't have to be criminals. They don't, because they learned how to be different, how to overcome their problems. And I think that that's what also companies should be able to do, not to punish people for doing the mistake, but finding out why don't they want to come to work? Why do they play solitaire? How do we give them perspective so they become motivated again? Because it's not the people's fault that they do bad things. It's a society who doesn't include them. And I think also a very interesting or what is very close to this topic is hiring. We often talk about um, hiring <clears throat> high potential, best talent. Um, I don't know. Um, and, and, and I wonder if we really know what we mean by that um, when, when we do it. And then we easily say when people do not fit anymore, either they became uh, low potentials and uh, Uh, bottom 10 uh, performers, low performers, um, and then we fire them again. And then, um, and, and, and I feel this is kind of the same discussion because we do not question ourselves. Did we integrate this talent right? Did we really take, did we take everything that we could into account to make sure that this person is intrinsically motivated, that It can that this person can create value within this organization. Um, did we realize why maybe their performance went up or down? Did, did we take any information out of this process? Um, yeah, and, and we put people into boxes and we make it easy for ourselves and, and say, okay, this is a this is a high potential and uh, this is not a high potential. And we also say it will stay a high potential forever or like, you know, Yeah. Um, maybe we can go back to the um, to the original topic again, to the Hippocratic Oath, because I think you have a, um, so Stefan is willing to support it, I think. Yeah. Um, and um, they are they are changing the, the, the stats and the values anyway. And there seems to be this great ethics professor, everybody of you had to think about, Andreas Suchanek. Um, and now I think he needs a team of um, highly motivated students to write him together with Stefan and say, Professor Suchanek, um, Stefan had this great idea inspired by a talk um, last night. Um, and we really want to um, set things moving now and set a legacy for our year of the HHL class of business, the first with Hippocratic Oath. Um, Hippocratic Oath. How can we uh, how can we get there? Um, we by the way we have um, we have coaches we have um, Anna Gottschalk we have Rolf Schlemkins and we have Waldemar and Philip from Einhorn. Um, do we need anybody else? We can get them. We'll see them. Ole has a comment. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, very inspiring when you were talking about um, empowerment, um, Philip. This goes to you with your entrepreneurial pledge. Um, I was really inspired when you talked about um, all the empowerment uh, you did at Einhorn, but I, I got confused and that's why I raised this question when you have this entrepreneurial pledge, because as far as I understand, um, companies or entrepreneurs sign up to it basically, and then they, um, by signing the entrepreneurial pledge, they pledge that half of their profits At least, or like at least half of their profits have to be given back to um, for good cause, or like back into the um, into the value chain. Did I get that right so far? Yes. So the um, it's for um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
maybe maybe I add my my question to that then in the end. So um, this uh, puts basically a sticker on entrepreneurs or startups of either you are good because you you signed this pledge or you are kind of not not part of this movement and get like this negative connotation from my point of view. So my question is, how does this, does this pledge really place into your understanding of empowerment? And isn't like, I, I completely support this movement, but I would have understood stand when, when listening to your empowerment speech more of a way like um, allowing uh, every entrepreneur to participate and do as much as they want to, not like 50%, but as much they can can afford or like as much as they would like to. And you incentivize them by having like best performance or like uh, still like uh, motivating people to- What's to the question? Get... My question is why does it have to have like a cut and why do people have to get the sticker and get be kind of separated. I, I don't understand where this fits into your empowerment. Well, um, first it's uh, it's like seven years ago. So um, then we started this and now we reinvest everything. So um, I think there should be no limits. You can reinvest everything. And um, um, the way you do business and the way you're an entrepreneur is of course your personal decision. I personally think you're a better entrepreneur if you reinvest into the value chain and you don't try to keep everything for yourself. But that's my personal you know, view on things. Doesn't mean other people are bad entrepreneurs. There are great entrepreneurs out there. I mean, Jeff Bezos is the, probably a very successful entrepreneur in terms of money, but I think he's not doing a very good job for the environment um, and for the people. So he's not empowering um, the, the people who work for him. Um, for shareholder values, he's the greatest entrepreneur. So that's all a point of perspective. And I think, we are not putting stickers um, um, on things. I think we are giving people the chance to evolve and in, uh, inspiring them to evolve into a different direction. If people want to feel treated, I mean, that's also what happens with the, with the new rechtsform that we, um, that we do. Uh, you know, this purpose company, the, the Mittelstand, the Familienunternehmen, they said, well, uh, do you want to label yourself as the good ones and the others are the bad ones then? And we said, well, we want to be labeled the good ones, but we never said you have to be labeled the bad ones. Are you the bad ones? We didn't say that. Um, and we basically want to be like a family company, like the, the Gute, uh, the Gute, the Kaufmann. That's what we want to get back on track with. And family enterprises already do that, like in many, many ways. But we want to do this without inheriting a company before. We want to do it now, like with a new legal form. And it doesn't take any thing away from other people it doesn't give stickers to other people it just there's a new sticker out there and you can put it on your car if you don't want it you don't get the bad sticker there's no bad stickers there's just the people are doing things differently and that's my sticker um, and of course we are convinced this is the better way of doing business so this is my but this is my opinion and there will be other people saying shareholder value that's the way to go well that's cool yeah, I think that um, I have some family duties to uh, cater to. I have to bring my two year old to bed. <laughs> so ah, um, I, I just put in the in the chat that I will reach out to our students to ask them to familiarize them with the idea and ask invite them to a discussion. Um, as from my side, you can stay here. I hand over to Anna. <laughs> Um, as, as host of today's session, I say thank you very much for participating, also for doing the discussions and um, uh, all the different comments. And uh, Philip, thanks for the inspirational feedback, input, uh, ideas, experience exchange that you did, and Anna also for yours. And uh, that said, I need to change some diapers. Bye bye. We are also going to close it off. Yes, everybody. Let's close it down. And, um, I'm looking forward to the to the pledge at HHL. I'm you... really excited. Yeah, we will have a follow up on this. Well, it's on you guys now and yeah. girls and ladies and gentlemen and everybody, professors and doctors, business yeah. students of the future.
it's uh, it's up to you okay bye Ciao. Have a good evening. thank you